considers consolidations or closures of processing facilities in the future, which processing studies for any impacted facility or other similar analysis before moving to uh, uh, thank, thank you, Senator. There is a, and I'm not totally familiar with it, but there is a whole process that, a, a pretty uh, detailed process that we need to go through uh, to before we close a, a, a facility. And I, I'd be, if that, we'll, we'll take that down. If that facility ever gets on that, I'll make sure we reach out to you in advance and uh, I'll let you know. But there is a, a whole public awareness process, a detailed analysis of as to how the mail is going to be processed, it's uh, it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, so, uh, uh, but we we have it marked down, and we'll keep you posted if that ever gets on our list of, in, of uh, well, interested locations. I appreciate that. Just for your awareness, the original AMP for Cherry Bell was done in 2011, and as you're probably aware, we've had very significant population growth throughout Arizona since then. So we want to make sure that decisions are made with up-to-date data. And so I'll follow up with you soon about this topic because mm -hmm. this is very important for Arizona um, and it's very important for our Southern Arizona in particular. Um, Mr. To... Chairman, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Mr. Troy. You just said, look forward to speaking to you about it. Thank you. I know my time is almost done. I, the last thing I'll just say is when you next consider operational changes, um, I'd ask you to take into account the negative customer experiences that folks have shared with us like spoiled medicine or missing rent checks. We've been getting more complaints about service getting worse in, since some of these most recent changes. We um, ask that you would take into account these negative customer experiences when making decisions in the future and my team is happy to share some of those direct experiences with you. Thank you uh, uh, for, for your guidance, Matt. Appreciate it. Uh, Thank you so much for being with us today. And Mr. Chairman, thank you for this opportunity and I yield back. Well, thank you, uh, Senator Sinema. Well, but let me just, uh, again, thank you, Mr. Postmaster, Postmaster General for appearing here on pretty short notice uh, and subjecting yourself to this uh, hearing process. Uh, just to quick summarize a few things we heard today. You know, obviously uh, the postal system is, uh, every bit is affected by COVID as the rest of this nation has been economically devastating. So I think for, for anybody to assume that uh, you know service would maintain its high level standards when we're in the midst of a pandemic, I think is quite unrealistic. Uh, as you've stated, uh, I think the, the operational changes that uh, you implemented uh, are designed for long-term improvement, but uh, they created some disruptions as well. Uh, so, but again, coming from a manufacturing background, I realize you have to have a good process. Things have to run on time. And you recognize that as well. So I'm again, I'm, I'm highly supportive of those efforts. I think they be, should be commended, not condemned. Um, as I stated, there's no doubt there have been some unusual delays, COVID, uh, some operational changes. But as I check with our constituent service folks, uh, what they are also finding is, is the high volume of calls uh, concerning post complaints. Uh, the vast majority seem very highly scripted. Like this could be a very well organized effort, which which doesn't surprise me in the slightest. Uh, there are fundraising uh, emails from Senate candidates and Senate uh, Senate and the Democrat senatorial uh, committee dating back as far as April, uh, complaining about this postal postal issue. So I have no doubt the Democrats are ginning this uh, these issues and these problems up into something that it's not a, a, a very false narrative, as I said, designed to. Uh, extract a, a political uh, advantage. And you know, Mr. Postmaster General, I'm just very sorry that you are on the, the targeting end of this political hit piece. I think, it's, I think it's very unfortunate, it's very tragic. This is, as somebody else pointed out, this is part of the problem why we have not had post reform is how, how people take advantage of it. And uh, again, the, the expectations I appreciate is Senator Enzi's uh, very common sense uh, a statement of, of a number of different facts. Uh, you've only been on the job 60 days. You've got a great background. I truly appreciate your willingness to serve this role. As you heard from the committee, we truly appreciate the, the, the hard work of the men and women of the U.S. Postal Service uh, doing a good job delivering our mail. Uh, but we need reforms moving forward. So we might have an opportunity here. Uh, there, there may be another COVID relief package. Uh, it probably will include something for postal. So if there's going to be dollars allocated, what I'm certainly asking uh, you for is the information, the data, 
and the suggestions for for true reforms. I think that's what's always been lacking as I've been in this position in terms of post reform. It's always a taxpayer bailout, bailout absent of the types of reforms that we need to also make legislatively. So I really look for your guidance. I look for your data. It's another real shortcoming from uh, my dealing with the U.S. Postal Service here. Uh, we just don't get the data that I think we really need to enact effective legislation. Uh, I'd like to actually enact effective legislation that's going to require uh, cooperation with, with you and, and the postal workers. So, again, you know, th thank you for your service. Thank you for stepping in this role. I apologize for uh, the, 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 the fact that you've become a target in a political hit job. Uh, it's very unfortunate. Uh, but with that, Mr. Uh, Chairman, Mr. Chairman, yeah, you, certainly. Factor, would you yield to me for for a minute or two, please? Absolutely. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks so much. The, uh, I, as you may recall, uh, Mr. Chairman, one of our colleagues, late Tom uh, Coburn, and I worked for years on uh, major changes in the Postal Service, real reforms. And we've done that. We've developed bipartisan and a consensus around that. And uh, we can do that again. Uh, among things that, that we've heard here today, there's an interest in uh, Medicare integration. I think we ought to look at that. Uh, there's an acknowledgement that uh, there need to be uh, major investments in the fleet, the postal fleet. Uh, the average age of the fleet of, uh, of, of postal vehicles, 27 years old. There are investments that need to be made for uh, additional modern package processing equipment in our distribution centers across the country. And there's, I think there's a, the, the ability to come up with, uh, with uh, a bipartisan consensus on how to help the Postal Service not just get through a pandemic, but be relevant and efficient and vibrant in the years to come. The, uh, the, the secret to vibrant democracy, the two C's, communicate and compromise. And uh, our, our, with all due respect to our uh, Postmaster General, I'm, I'm pretty good at bipartisan compromise. I reached out to you when you were just uh, initially selected by the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Postal Board of Governors. And then later on, I tried to reach you again and again for weeks. And couldn't even get a, a call back, and I wasn't the only one. You got to be willing to communicate. You got to be willing to communicate. And there's some people in the administration who, who do a great job at that. Bob Lighthizer, a trade representative, is one. A Mnuchin, Secretary of, of uh, Treasury, is one. And I would urge you to to emulate uh, them. Uh, this is a shared responsibility. It's not on the post office. It's not on the men and women who work at the post office. It's not on the board of governors or on you as a postmaster. It's on us as well. This is a shared responsibility. Our country is counting on, counting on us. And, I'm, and we're counting on a democracy. Last thing I'll mention, I go back to Ben Franklin, first postmaster general. Remember what he said coming out of that building at the end of the Constitutional Convention when they said, what have you done here? What have you created? And he said, a republic if we can keep it. A republic if we can keep it. And one of the keys to keeping it is, frankly, a vibrant postal service and the ability for people to vote, Democrat, Republican, or whatever, for people to cast their votes and know they're going to be counted. That's critical. We've got a president, sadly, who wants to undermine Say a little uh, bit. Fun, the <laughs> postal service and the undermine the ability to vote by mail. That's just unacceptable. Hopefully we can do better than that. And I'm, I met my, uh, for myself, some of my colleagues to try to do just that. Do better. We can always do that. In order to form a more perfect union, we can do better. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, if I could uh, say a few comments too, just briefly. Senator Peters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Postmaster uh, DeJoy, I just I want to take an opportunity to thank you uh, as well for appearing us uh, appearing before us so willingly and certainly on uh, very short notice. But I also want to be very clear about what I've been hearing, and I think you've heard from my members, and just uh, to counter a little bit of what the chairman said. These are real concerns that I'm hearing. These are not manufactured. These are people who are coming forward, talking about delays, talking about medicine that's not available for them, talking about how we, I have this, I sure shared the story with a, an individual who who did because of uh, the lack of medicine uh, skipped uh, doses and was actually uh, hospitalized. Those, those are very real. And when I hear those kinds of stories, we stand up. That's my job. It's the job of every senator here to stand up and for our constituents, for the people back home who are being hurt and make sure that their voice is heard. That's what this is about. It's about making sure people's voices are heard. And that is what this hearing is about. This is why we're standing up and making sure the Postal Service does what they have done with incredible integrity and professionalism for 245 years. We want to make sure that that standard continues going forward. I fully appreciate that the COVID has created significant problems uh, for the Postal Service, but I won't show my chart again. But if you look at the chart, the service was there through the 
through uh, a lot of uh, the pandemic, it's just been in the middle of July where you see it dropping off dramatically. The COVID's been with us since March, but we've seen a dramatic drop since mid-July, which is the time when I got uh, all of those communications, and my colleagues have been getting those com uh, those communications. They're not manufactured. These are real people. So they certainly people. are. So I, I just want to be clear about that. So, uh, Mr. Uh, or Postmaster Joy, you, you answered um, uh, some of our questions today, and I thank you for that. But, but there's still many, many left that are unanswered. And I think we all look forward to uh, seeing the documents that we have requested so we can do our oversight function, deliver to us in a timely fashion. I appreciate your willingness to do that. I'm going to continue my investigation of uh, the recent uh, delays and postal service practices that have been put in place. And I, and I urge you and your staff uh, to be fully forthcoming with any additional requests. That kind of transparency is critically important in this job. I know you have a very hard job. And frankly, I think you've made it harder on yourself because of the lack of transparency that we have seen here these last few weeks. So in the coming weeks, Congress uh, certainly must provide Postal Service uh, with the resources and the oversight that you need to reliably deliver mail for the American people, uh, but not just through this election. Uh, we have to make sure we get through the election, we've got to get through the pandemic, and we want to make sure we put the Postal Service on sound financial footing to last for another 245 years and beyond. So thank you again. Thank you, Okay, thanks, Senator Peters. And again, I, I am in no way, shape, or form denying that uh, many of these complaints are absolutely genuine and, and we take these seriously and help our constituents. But there's also no doubt that uh, a lot of this is, is being ginned up. Uh, many of those complaints are highly scripted and uh, it's being done for p political purpose. I mean, there's absolutely no doubt about that. Uh, we have a new postmaster general who's been in, in the office less than 70 days. You know, from my standpoint, I think the first thing he, sh he needed to do is get up. Uh, get, you know, start the job, roll up his shirt, her, his, uh, shirt sleeves and, and get to work and try and figure out uh, what he needs to do to reform the process. So uh, I, I, I'm looking forward to a totally transparent process here. I'm looking to separate the fact from the fiction. And my problem is there's a lot of fiction, uh, a lot of false narrative being ginned up by, by Democrats and left right now. So I, I want the data as well. Uh, Mr. Postmaster General, I'm sure you will, you will work with us in the future. And that's what I'm basically giving you the opportunity to do. I th there's a possibility for a, a post reform bill, even in uh, this next COVID relief package, if, if there is one. So uh, let's work in good faith. Uh, thank you again for your service. Thank the men and women of the US, United States Postal Service for their uh, service as well. Uh, the hearing record will remain open for 15 days until September 3rd at 5 p.m. for the submission of statements and questions for the record. This hearing is adjourned. Thank you.
Postal Service lose last year? $8.8 billion. It seems like you might want to try to do something about that. But no. Democrats with this bill, H.R. 8015, want to dump billions of tax dollars into a broken system that they are now handcuffing UPS to through the rest of the pandemic. Not just until after the election, through the rest of the pandemic. And what about all these disappearing mailboxes? All these sorting machines that are being removed and dismantled. That's part of a long standing process of refurbishing and upgrading older unsecure mailboxes and taking mailboxes from, from places where people do not use them because cities change over time and putting them in places where they do. This maintenance process is one of the many ways the Postal Service adjusts its infrastructure costs to match declining mail volumes. Over the last seven years, we have removed an average of 3,100 boxes per year. And get this, during the Obama years, the number of mailboxes declined by 12,000. I never heard any Democrat outrage over that. Never heard of any Democrat calling for any special committee hearing, much less an emergency vote on a Saturday in Congress to address the 12,000 boxes that President Obama removed. At a time when package volumes have skyrocketed due to e-commerce, while mail volume is down almost 33% in 15 years, it makes no sense to have letter carriers wasting trips to empty mailboxes. It also makes no sense to have mail sorters sitting dormant taking up space and facilities that could be better used for package delivery equipment. But why conduct this routine maintenance and seek operational improvements now? Why embark on such a risky plan as having things actually run on time three months before a critical national election? Maybe it was an honest attempt to get things working better. When I return from the future after Monday's committee hearing, assuming I can find a time machine, I'll give you a download from what Mr. DeJoy and the Postal Board of Governors Chairman say on the subject during the Oversight Committee hearing. As for vote by mail, the Postal Service is capable of handling the additional volume. In fact, it welcomes the additional mail volume and revenue. It's a great opportunity for the Postal Service. Let's get a little perspective here. This year, the Postal Service processed 10.9 billion pieces of mail in the month of June during a global pandemic. Think about that for a second. If every registered voter in America decided to vote by mail, both requested and returned their ballot by mail, that would amount to 350 million pieces or so of mail. That's 3% of June's delivery, 3%. Or put another way, this would amount to 2% of their overall volume for the holiday peak season. What the Postal Service cannot control are the mismatch of state election laws made without consideration of Postal Service operating standards and delivery timeframes. What the Postal Service cannot control are election offices completely ill-equipped to handle ballot printing, record keeping, and processing of vote by mail demand, increasing by several orders of magnitude. I'm not sure whether or how these issues come into play with HR 8015's $25 billion bailout. Has the Postal Service incurred unanticipated costs due to the pandemic? Yes, but from briefings and limited information, we believe pandemic costs amount to something around $500 million per year. While between March 16th and August 16th, the Postal Service has made about $1.5 billion more than the same period last year and currently sits on a cash pile of $15.1 billion. Has anyone provided a plan for how the $25 billion taxpayer bailout will be spent? No. What would the American people get in return? They might get to sue the post office and they get the legal assurance that nothing will improve. What we need is a serious effort to fix this business model of the Postal Service, an effort like that was led by the late Chairman Elijah Cummings and the current White House Chief of Staff and former committee member Mark Meadows. Unfortunately, that effort stalled largely due to the prior Postmaster General's failure to deliver an updated business reform plan as promised at our committee hearing over a year ago. I would welcome an opportunity 
to have a serious, mature, and good faith discussion regarding postal reform issues that actually accomplish something meaningful. But this week's debate and legislating has been anything but productive. Americans deserve better, and I yield back. Mr. Chairman? Oh, excuse me. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in the spirit of bipartisanship, because there are a number of Republicans that support my bill, I have offered an amendment that the chair, the ranking member referred to on a private right of action, deleting that from the bill at their request. I truly do want this to be a bipartisan effort, and I truly am open to any suggestions that allow us to maintain the mail, make sure it gets to the people, helps us get through this pandemic and the election. I, I Delivering the mail should be bipartisan, and I, I want to make sure that you know about this amendment, Mr. Okay. Chairman, and we're deleting it from the bill. Thank you. I yield back. Appreciate it. Mr. Chairman. Mr. 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 Comer. Well, I appreciate uh, the amendment, and uh, that's something that uh, is a step in the right direction. Yeah. But in the sense of bipartisanship, I believe that we should have a committee hearing. I believe we should go through regular order. And at the very least, at the very least, I would like to have a plan of where that $25 billion is gonna be spent. Then I think we would be uh, more willing to get some Republican support for the bill. Well, hopefully Republicans will support this uh, bill and uh, we'll, uh, we'll think, um, I hope so. Uh, Mr. Mr. Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, th this is a sad moment. You know, this president has really dragged some good and decent people into positions that are completely indefensible. And uh, I have enormous respect. Uh, I've served with uh, Mr. Cole for many years. And I have uh, enormous respect for him and the work that he has done. Uh, take exception with some of the comments he made in his opening statement that uh, he said that our concern uh, were based on wild allegations that had no basis in fact uh, regarding the delivery of the mail. I, I just want to offer for the record uh, and ask unanimous consent to submit uh, a letter uh, August 29th from the United States Postal Service that was sent to 46 states saying that they do not believe that they can deliver the ballots for the upcoming election in time to be counted in that election. The letter is from the United States Postal Service. The post office has been operating for 230 years. They used to deliver by, by, by horse. And we've never had a letter like this sent out, not during the First World War, not during the pandemic of 1918, during the First World War, Second World War. 9-11, we had direct attacks, anthrax attacks on the post office. This is the first time in 200 sent out a letter to states to say we cannot de deliver the goddamn disgrace. And 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 it just it just it it makes me so sad, so sad that we have colleagues on the other side of the aisle saying there's no problem here and that this is something that has been drummed up. I just left the the poll and the, the standard delay on their mail, five days. So when it comes in, instead of going on the platform for five days before it goes out, you know what that means for the... They ripped out uh, three million... Boston... Six of those high speed sorting me hour. Three in Western uh, Central Mass, where Jim McGovern represents. Look, this is an attack on our democracy and an attack on this election. And it is shameful, shameful. The president's own statements. Uh, it just breaks my heart. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle, I'm defending this, this crap, this crap.
this attack on our, our democracy. Look, Congress has a responsibility here. Not only Article 1, uh, Section 8, Clause 7, that gives us responsibility to make sure that the, the, the mail is delivered, but also...
Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the Council for National Policy, Bill Walton. Is this a great day? <laughs> uh, Bob McEwen and I and all of CMP are, are thrilled to have the President of the United States joining us today. And uh, let's remember what he's accomplished before the virus hit and will continue to accomplish after it recedes. He's cut taxes, deregulated, brought back an economic climate that encourages business to invest, hire, and expand. He's ending bloody and costly military interventions that serve, that serve no clear American interest, while at the same time rebuilding our military capability. He's completely recalibrated our policy toward China, bringing a whole-of-government response to China's global ambitions. He's made, America in, uh, he's made America energy independent by allowing fracking and horizontal drilling, which Joe Biden and Kamala Harris say they would end immediately if they're elected. He's been the most pro-religious freedom, pro-life, and pro-Israel pro, pro -Israel president of the United States in history. He has appointed more constructionist federal judges at all levels than any other first-term Republican president. And he has also shown he has the willpower to keep law and order, to stop the madness of statute toppling, arson, spiraling crime, shakedowns, cancel culture, and the complete writing, rewriting of American history. As Victor David Hansen reminds us, between the abyss and what's going on in Portland and the Magnificent Mile, there's nothing else but Donald Trump standing in the breach. So thank you, Mr. President, for sacrificially honoring your word to be with us on this very important day of your life. On behalf of the millions of members of our various organizations, and with deep gratitude in our hearts for your dedication to God and our country, ladies and gentlemen, the 45th President of the United States, Donald J. Trump.
fantastic, and I want to thank you very much. You really are. Thank you very much, and thank you, Bill. And thank you to the Council for National Policy. My brother, Robert, would have wanted me to be here today. Thank you very much. Together, we're committed to protecting the American people, preserving American values, defending America's heritage, and keeping America safe, strong, prosperous, and free. I want to thank Bob McEwen, Kelly Shackelford, and Jenny Beth Martin for your tremendous leadership of the CNP. Done a fantastic job. We're also joined by Acting Secretary of Homeland Security, who's done incredibly, Chad Wolf. Where's Chad? Thank you very much, Chad. You're right in the heart of it, and uh, got some big things coming. Very big things. Good job. Also, Lieutenant Governor, a friend of mine, Dan Patrick of Texas. Dan, Dan, wherever you may be. What a great guy. Great family, great son, doing a tremendous job as U.S. Attorney. And many other state and local officials, I want to thank you all for being here. We have a lot of, a lot of horsepower here. A lot of firepower, you might want to say. But over the last week, the Democrats held the darkest and angriest and gloomiest convention in American history. They spent four straight days attacking America as racist and a horrible country that must be redeemed. Joe Biden grimly declared a season of American darkness. And yet, look at what we've accomplished until the plague came in. Look at what we've accomplished. And now we're doing it again. It's the most successful period of time in the history of our country, from every standard. Look what we've accomplished. And now this play comes in, and look at the way they talk. But look at what's happening, and look at how we're shooting up. We call it a Super V. It's no longer a V. It's a Super V. And they didn't think that could happen, and they're probably not happy about it. They want to punish America and its citizens instead of holding them high. Where Joe Biden sees American darkness, I see American greatness. We've seen heroic doctors and nurses racing into action to save lives. We've seen first responders helping strangers in need. We've seen the passage of historic legislation to save 50 million American jobs. We've mobilized American industry like never before. We've built military hospitals from scratch, produced life-saving therapies, and we're on track to develop the most incredible, from a standpoint of time, record time, vaccines. We have vaccines. You'll be reading about them very soon, way, way ahead of schedule, years ahead of schedule. This would have been where we are now, phase three trials, clinical trials. Uh, you wouldn't have been there in two or three years if you went back to another administration. It's time to reject the anger and the hate of the Democrat Party. We have the biggest election coming up of our lifetime. No party can lead America that spends so much time tearing down America. But the biggest part of last night's speech was what Joe Biden didn't talk about. He didn't talk about law enforcement. He didn't talk about bringing safety to Democrat-run cities that are totally out of control and they have no clue. China was never mentioned in any way, shape, or form. China will own our country if he gets elected. They will own our country. And we're not going to let that happen. And you've seen the intelligence reports. China very much wants Joe Biden to win. That would be very insulting if they wanted me to win. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. We've taken in billions and billions of dollars from China. We've given it to our farmers. We've given it to a lot. They had the worst year they've had in 67 years. We had the best year we ever had. 
We've demonstrated over the last four years the extraordinary gains that are possible when we stand strong for our beliefs, when we trust the wisdom of our founders, and when we embrace America's destiny. It's a great destiny. With your help, we carried out the largest tax and regulation cuts by far in American history. And And they now want to quadruple taxes, and they want to quadruple and beyond the regulation cuts. And when we say tax and we say regulation, and you say, oh, tax cuts, that's so wonderful. But the people in this room that are the heads of industry, you have some very powerful people in this room, they know that the regulation cuts may have been even more important than the biggest tax cuts we've ever had. To build a highway in this country could take, in certain places, 18, 19, 20, even 21 years to get approved. It's, this is not even it's thinkable. And we've got it now down to two, and we'll have it down to probably one. And it may get rejected for safety reasons or for environmental reasons. That's okay. It may happen. But we have it down. We will soon have it down to one year from as much as 21 years. We have cases that have just been uh, disastrous. So I just wanted you to know some of the little details, but that's what we're working on. We'll have it down to one year to get, build a highway. You can do it all in one year. It doesn't have to take 21 years. And cost 100 times more. Literally, I've seen 100 times more. We eliminated Obamacare's unfair individual mandate penalty, which is really the elimination of Obamacare. <laughs> and to give to critically ill patients uh, access to life-saving drugs. We passed a thing called, and hopefully nobody in this room will need it, but if you do, it's right to try. We have the greatest medicines, the greatest doctors and labs in the world, and we have things that won't be approved by the FDA for a little while, although I've cut that time now down in half. It used to be 12 years. Now we've cut it down in more than half. And you see that with the vaccines. You see it with the therapeutics. But right to try where we have the right to now go in and use some of these very promising drugs, and the response has been unbelievable. What's happened and the lives saved have been really incredible. People used to leave for Asia. They used to leave for Europe. They used to leave for other places all over the world, or they'd go home and die. They'd go home and die. If they had no money, they'd go home and die, which is most people. Now they sign a very short, simple document, and they have the right to try, and it's given them hope, and in many cases, it's given their life back. So it's been a great thing. These are things that nobody talks about, but it's, uh, they've been trying to get that approved, by the way. Not as easy as it sounds. It's complicated because you have the insurance companies and the doctors and the hospitals and the country itself doesn't want to get sued. And uh, so not, not very easy. But they've been trying to get it approved by — for 41 years, they've been trying to get that. That's just one of many, many things that we've done for 41 years. To provide our amazing veterans the care they deserve, we passed VA accountability and VA choice. Many, many decades they've been trying to get that. <laughs> choice meaning you wait online and you can't see a doctor, and they would wait online for a week or two weeks, or five weeks. Sometimes they'd be ill, and they'd end up being terminally ill by the time they saw the doctor. And we're letting them go out, get a private doctor immediately, and we pay the bill. And uh, we just got a 91 percent approval rating in the VA, the highest we've ever had by many points, 91 percent. And VA accountability sounds simple, but it's not. You couldn't let anybody go, no matter how they disrespected our great vets, no matter what they said to them, no matter how badly they treated them. And we had sadists, and we had thieves, and we had a lot of bad people. You couldn't fire them under any circumstances. Under any circumstance, you couldn't fire them. And now we say, you, you fired. <laughs> well, VA accountability. And they've wanted to have that 
They've wanted to have that. Actually, they've let go of 9,000 people, replaced them with people that love our vets, want to take care of our vets, and great people. And uh, we had a terrible thing going. You couldn't get them fired because of, you know, civil service and unions and different things. You couldn't fire them. Now you can fire them, and you can fire them quickly if they're not doing the job. It's a big deal. And uh, we don't talk about it a lot. Nobody talks about it. But they've been trying to get those two things approved for more than four decades. And now they're done and they're approved. We ended the Obama-Biden administration's war on American energy. And the United States is now the leading producer of oil and natural gas anywhere in the world. It's a big thing. And remember this, uh, if you look at what they're doing, Biden, he wants to end fracking, end petroleum products, end petroleum, no natural gas, no nothing, end everything. And that's it. How does that work in Texas? How does that work in Pennsylvania? I was in Pennsylvania yesterday, a place that he said he was born in, which is true, but he left when he was like nine years old. So he left a long time ago. He left, he left seven decades ago. <laughs> and he still calls it his home. And his real home is a place he never leaves anymore. He just <laughs> never leaves. He never leaves the, the outskirts of that state. You'd think he'd go a little bit, you know. It's not that far. Never leaves. We'll figure it out pretty soon. I think. But they want to end uh, fracking. They want to end drilling. They want to end everything. They want to end uh, all of that. So I, I said, think of it. They want to end oil. They want to end, and this is the way it is, guns. They want to take away Second Amendment, right? How about that? That alone should win you the election, right? That alone. And And I protected your Second Amendment. And you think that was easy for the last four years? Everyone said, oh, look, he's wilting. He's wilting. And uh, no, we're not wilting. And we've had people that were in tragedies, and uh, they lost a son in a school. And uh, they lost a daughter, beautiful meadow. And that gentleman's been a friend of mine. He knows exactly who I'm talking about. Beautiful meadow. They're totally in favor. They've actually gotten hard line on Second Amendment. It's not one way. Uh, it's an incredible thing to see, actually. But uh, we held totally strong, and it's uh, always going to be with us. But if they get in, they will absolutely either obliterate it to a point of no return or actually terminate it. And I have no doubt about it. I have absolutely no doubt about it. And it's something we can't let happen, such a big part of our security and our safety. And your entertainment and all. But I say security and safety probably first, right? And uh, God, it's an attack on God. It's an attack on religion. Did you see the man that got up and sang a very, very special phrase from a very, very special thing? And he left the word God out. And I was watching, and I said, oh, he must have made a mistake. I didn't think that he left it out. I thought maybe he, you know, that could happen. Maybe he made a mistake. He didn't make a mistake. That's where they're coming from. He left the word God out, and that's where they're coming from. I withdrew from the one-sided parrot, if you, if you see it, the Paris climate. I call it the Paris climate disaster. This was a way of... This was a way of taking advantage of the United States. We wouldn't be able to drill. We wouldn't be able to frack. We wouldn't have energy. Uh, Russia went way back into the dirtiest years. China didn't even come into it until 2030 or 2035. And when they did, they came in very lightly. 
We came in immediately, and we would have had to close down many, many businesses in order to to uh, achieve the goals that they set, which are totally unrealistic. We would have. It was a disaster. And you know, it's an amazing thing when I did that, and when I did a couple of others, uh, environmental bills, the Clean Waters Act. How about that? It sounds so beautiful. The name is so beautiful. In fact, when I did it, I said, "I'm going to be killed on this one," and I did it. And I was surrounded by farmers and uh, developers, builders that build houses and others. And they never cried. They're very strong people. They never cried a day in their life. They were almost all crying. I said, what was this big, strong guy? What was the last time you cried? I can't remember, sir. I gave them back their life. You know, that took away, right? That took away, that took away their life. And what we did in Minnesota with the iron ore, People came up to me. They said, you gave us back our life. Obama wrote it out. Iron ore, the best in the world. He wrote it out. We gave it back to them. We went up to Maine. We gave them back their lobsters. We gave them back their fishing. <laughs> 5,000 square miles. Think of what that is. Take one mile, mile by mile, and now you add five, as big as the ocean is, that was a big chunk, right off the coast of Maine. The whole thing is like lobsters and fishing, and nobody does it better. And they were not allowed. It was a monument, called a monument. I said, a monument to what? I said to the, when I was up in Maine two weeks ago, I said, <laughs> I said to people that their whole life was lobster, fishing, you know, the different things, and they're the best. I said, what happened? He said, they, he took away our, took away our everything. I said, how does this area compare to other areas? He said, first of all, it takes a long time to get to the other areas. This is so big. But second of all, this is the best there is in the world. And he doesn't let us use it. And I said, and yet you vote Democrat. And so I don't know. <laughs> it's like uh, Israel. Look what I did for Israel. Thank you. But it's amazing to me because nobody's been worse to Israel than President Obama and Biden. Nobody. Nobody's been worse. Look at the Iran deal. It's the worst thing that ever happened to Israel. And they never moved the embassy to Jerusalem, thereby making Jerusalem the capital of Israel, which I did. And neither did any other president. And I understand why. They campaign on it, campaign. Every president said they were going to do it. No president did it until I came along. And the pressure, and I will tell you, the pressure from other parts of the world was enormous. And uh, I've told the story a few times where I just turned off my phone, and when the king calls, and this one calls, and that one calls, we're calling about Israel. I say, tell him I'll get back in a couple of days. <laughs> huh? I'll get back in a couple of days. I'll, I'll be in next week. <laughs> Kings and queens and Prime Ministers, Presidents, and Dictators, everybody was calling, don't do it, don't do it. It'll be bloodshed all over the Middle East. Look what we just did, right? With United Arab Emirates and Israel. And now others will fight. And we couldn't have done that if we had the deal with Iran. But they said, don't do it, don't do it with Israel, don't do it. And